Aston Martin turns 110 years old in 2023 and is unwrapping this rather exciting new DB12 to celebrate. It's a hell of a birthday present, proving there's life yet in the DB bloodline that goes back all the way to 1948 and the first two litre. The DB12 will go on sale in late summer 2023, replacing the DB11 as what Aston Martin ambitiously calls the world's first Super Tourer. It's the first in a new generation of Aston Martin sports cars, promising the usual style, performance and dynamics we've come to know and love, but with a newfound focus on advanced technologies too. Let's come and take a closer look. And to tell us more about the DB12, I'm delighted to say we're joined by Miles Nuremberger, who's the Director of Design at Aston Martin. Miles, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, my pleasure. And I mean, this is the first time we've seen the car. It's a lot to take in. Tell us, very big question, but what were you trying to achieve? What was the brief to follow up the DB11 with? So yeah, you're right, absolutely big question. Um, this is, I would present this as our Super Tourer two big elements in it. One is performance driven, ultra luxury, two bits. Performance driven, we'll talk about that a bit more in terms of cooling and everything like that. In terms of ultra luxury, we have made a massive step change on the interior of our cars. Right, and the face, I mean, look at it, we've got a lot going on here. The, the grill is really big, and I understand the sort of the cooling area yeah. is 56% bigger. Now, not necessarily the grill's 56% bigger, but yeah. the, the, cool, yeah. the cooling available to the car is important for the engine, but that's a big grill. Talk us about, talk us through this. Yeah, big, big step in performance for the car. So the grill, the cooling becomes far, far more important. The grill is um, probably one of the largest grills that's been on a DB. Actually, it's very reminiscent of DB5 in terms of the proportion to the sort of eyes, grill, overall mass of the car. Um, there is a little bit of DB5 coming through. We're not 56% bigger. We are, um, we use a lot of, in terms of the V8 engine, we're now actually layering some of the coolers in the corner of the car. So with cooling the car and aero efficiency, it's air off as well as air on. And you can stuff all the air you want into the front of the car. If it can't escape, yeah. then you don't get flow rate. So you'll notice the um, bonnet has grown some very, very distinct um, air off features through that and actually under the car as well, all the air management that goes in there. Right, but it's so, it's so distinctive. And I guess with a bigger grill, the lights, for me, I, I see a little bit of kind of 2000 era Vanquish there, they're a bit bigger, they're LED, very technical. Talk us through the sort of the, the eyes of the car. Yeah, um, yeah, a few people have said that. There's a little bit of Vanquish. I think it comes from DB11 was quite a technical car. And this has a more, how do I say, more fluid, more romantic gesture to the car. And actually, even if you look across car, um, this section through here is actually, there's a little bit of 2000 Vanquish, but there's also a bit of DB5 going on there. It goes to more, that more um, sensual, traditional Aston nature. Yeah, and 75 years of DB, what a heritage yeah. to draw on. I mean, yeah. the, the DB4 as well, actually, with that grill, you know, the sort of the GT yeah. uh, cars and what have you. And speaking of heritage and history, the badge yeah. is a little bit bigger. This is the first application of the new Aston Martin badge, I yeah, understand. Yeah, so we introduced our new corporate identity, probably it's a bit over a year now, but this is the first car to wear the new badge. And yes, the badge is a little bit bigger, but it is sitting very nicely in proportion with the headlamps and the grille. Under the bonnet lies the four litre Mercedes AMG V8 bi-turbo, mounted so far back in the chassis that Aston calls it front mid-engined. There will be no V12 this time, maybe because the V8's outputs have soared to 671 brake horsepower and 590 pound foot, available all the way from 2750 RPM. That's a third more torque than the outgoing DB11, thanks to larger diameter turbos and reprofiled cams. It's enough for 0 to 60 in three and a half seconds and a 202 mile an hour top speed. You can see why the V12 was deemed unnecessary. The V8 sends drive to the rear wheels through an eight speed ZF automatic transaxle at the back. 
and there's Aston Martin's first electronically controlled rear differential too, which can go from fully open to 100% locked in milliseconds. So around here, we've got the very identifiable Aston Martin side strake. Yeah. This is a sort of a long-standing design feature of the side of your cars, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, you can read it back into history a very, very long way. Um, he, here, it's, it's not, not just form, it's function as well. So behind it, we're actually bleeding air off the, uh, the front tyre through um, something that got nicknamed Curly Q from the aero part that was sort of... Um, it was an aero part of an F1 car that was hacked and put in the, um, in the wind tunnel model, and it kept the name Curly Q internally, and, and it got known as that. But basically, we're bleeding um, air off the front tyre. It comes out through the slots here and actually helps um, for multiple reasons. So it's the air that comes off the bonnet, instead of flowing and hitting the A post and generating wind noise as unfortunately air does, it pulls it down the side of the body, um, it encourages the flow down the side of the body. Right. And it's obviously now carrying the Aston Martin name as well. I think yeah, it's a... something we brought back. Some of the older cars used to carry it. So for years, it's just been um, clean. But actually, if you go back in history, it used to have Aston Martin written on it, and um, we felt it was, a, it was a nice touch to bring back. Right. And look, these are big wheels, 21 inches yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, that's a, now, interestingly, that's one inch bigger than on the DB11, yeah. and yet they're eight kilos lighter. I like that kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. kind of mass. <laughs> I think that, that you see there then this performance mindset in the company that to some extent has come from Valkyrie of being exposed to that F1 world, which is just relentless, ruthless in terms of efficiency, optimization. And I think that culture has just stayed, a lot of that has stayed with the company um, after that project. So I think with the design team, when they look at a wheel and they see the weight and they, you know, in their head, they're going, right, well, actually, it would be a better performance car if I could find another kilos out of it. So they're looking at sections and everything with the engineers trying to optimise. And, and actually, this car here, I think, is on the ceramic uh, brake option as well, yeah. which is... Uh, 410 millimeters, yeah, yeah. plumbing huge, aren't they? Bigger than yeah. my dinner plates. Um, and yet they're lighter, I think they're 28 kilos lighter than the standard uh, oh, yeah, yeah. iron, so iron disc, which is extraordinary. Um, and when we keep sort of moving down here, um, now tell me about the, the mirrors. We've got this sort of frameless setup here. Yeah, so for the first time, we've actually got a completely frameless design on the car. So normally the mirror glass moves inside the head and then that generates really thick sections. You've got to, um, meet all the legal requirements for head impact and radiuses at all movements. Um, so one of our engineers cleverly came up with the idea of doing it frameless. So the glass is always in the position relative to the head, but the actual head moves. Um, what that means is actually this car overall is narrower than its predecessor, which is very, very rare in the world nowadays. Almost yeah. every car that gets launched gets wider and wider and wider. Actually, the overall width, you know, the old mirror used to be about out here. So frontal area of the mirror, aerodynamics of the mirror are improved. That's, which is a fantastic thing. And I yeah. believe it's about five millimeters shorter. So this is a rare yes. occasion. I like, can't yes. slightly yes. on a diet. Fantastic. And moving down here, now, obviously, this car is, uh, I think, got the sort of carbon pack yes. on. So t talk us through how, it's, um, how it manifests itself. So we've got, um, for the carbon pack here, you can see the mirror, what we call the mirror scalp, um, the, um, what's known as the cant rail um, in carbon fibre. And then at the rear of the car, you've got the lower splitter and the bumper area all in carbon too. On the lower part of the car, you'll see this extra splitter down the side. And also on the front corner, there's an additional splitter. So that, that makes okay. up all the carbon elements. And, and these would be an optional extra. This is yeah. not on top. So this is quite a high spec car. Yeah. And we've got pop out door handles, yes. I see as well. Yes. Just a bit flusher or what's no, the point? No, no, no. I mean, we've, we've, uh, you know, we've been much copied in this area, but actually Aston have had beautiful flush door handles uh, of um, uh, this format for a number of years. It was something that was pioneered and, um, and we've kept with it. And what about the form language, the body surfacing? Talk us yeah. through what you're doing here. It's very very simple and it's very muscular I can see and I think we yeah you know we we're talking earlier it's about it's, it's the stance is really strong we're about I think a 22 mil broader yeah, 22 mil broader than at the, the rear than the, yeah. six at the front so it's kind of talk us through it and you really see that the minute you see it on the road that 22 mil the car just pops its haunches that bit more um, all the feature lines you know this is just 
You know, it's, a, it's about the little subtle things. This line just pointing to the top of the tire, the mass of the pillar here, this sits directly over the rear wheel. They're all little touches in terms of getting the proportion of the car right. And when you do, the car just, it plonks yeah. down on the road. It really sits and, there. I mean, standing here as I am, I mean, yeah. crikey, that rear, yeah, that yeah, rear, yeah. That rear yeah. haunch, it's very haunchy indeed. I, I think the fuel tank's 78 litres, so you've got a good touring range yeah. on the car as well. And then let's move around the back, Miles. Let's come and have a look around here. Talk us through what's going on here. We've got the signature Aston Martin wraparound lights, I can see. What were you trying to achieve at the rear? I, I think it's, it's really a carry through of what we talked about on the uh, on stance. So rear of the car, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get the car to be look as slim and as wide as possible. And those wheels, you know, really sitting out to the edge of the car, sitting the rear end. So when you follow it, it's just... It's got that, that, that look to it. Which you can, which you, I mean, standing yeah. here, you really, really see yeah, that yeah. bigger badge again. I understand um, the bodywork, the panels are essentially composite and aluminium. Yeah, the, the, the car in general is that mix and you see that again on the rear, yeah. And, and it's based on the, the sort of a latest iteration of the Aston platform. So it's extruded and bonded aluminium. Yep. Stiffer, 7% more torsional rigidity, great yeah. for the... Um... And, the, and the big change that happened between the first generation of that bonded aluminium is, is there are a number of pressings in the car, and that was basically, there's moments where an extrusion, although super efficient in terms of strength manufacturing, is not good for package space. So in key areas when we were going through this generation of car, we swapped to some pressings to basically eke out those last a millimeters. Bit more, a bit more space. For. And coming around here, we've got this wonderful, the um, Aston Martin aero blades. Talk us through the aero on the car, it's very clever how this works. Yeah, it? yeah, it was, a, it was a very unique system. So um, inspired by design and aero team really together um, from F-duct in Formula One. Uh, and it was just looking at how do we keep, you know, there's this beautiful silhouette to the car, almost a bit 1970s, you know, there's no big wing on the back of it to get its aero performance. So it's actually taking air through what's called the, the C duct here, channeling it through, through a duct that if you open the boot, you'll see, and basically out of two sections through the rear here, it generates a blade of air that is roughly a meter high out of the back of the car. Um, why do we do it? It's to give rear end stability, downforce, um, but with almost zero drag. So normally, whenever you add downforce, you add lots of drag, but because it's a, a blade of air rather than a physical wall, yep. mm. there's, there's almost no drag. And you mentioned, I mean, the sort of space on board. And if we look in here inside the boot, you can see actually it's 262 litres. It's a bit bigger than you might expect on a car yes. like this. Yeah, yeah, I think it surprises people sometimes quite how much luggage space you can get in there. Plenty enough for your shopping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we haven't yet mentioned uh, the, the Michelin uh, Pilot Sport 5 um, tyres, which is the first application yes. um, anywhere on any OEM, which is interesting. I mean, these are proper AML badges say that this is uh, yeah. tuned for the DB12. And I think, you know, that, that again, clearly shows the performance credentials this car is uh, gunning for. Yeah, and one of the things I've noticed they have, there's a polyurethane layer built into the carcass to make it a little bit quieter. They claim 20% less noise. And that's important for a super uh, tourer, isn't it? Yes, so, you know, we're looking for performance, but with a super tourer, you must have refinement. It must be a very nice place to sit and, and travel a, a potentially a long journey in. Also new are the Bilstein DTX adaptive dampers, said to have five times the bandwidth for improved response and the ability to flick from sports mode to comfort GT at the push of a button. So Miles, the interior of the DB12, it feels more different than the exterior, if I'm honest. Was this a deliberate thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a massive change. It's all new, basically. The IP, the steering wheel, the infotainment, the centre console, the doors, the seats, everything's new on this car. It's a big, big set change for the brand. It's a big investment in the brand. It's something internally we started three years ago, and this is really the first time you see all the efforts of the design engineering team, their fruits of their labour come to life. I think the ex external, it, more evolutionary, it is very different, but in here it's, it's revolution, isn't it? Is that reflect the fact that the DB11 
was feeling a little bit tired inside, do you think? Yeah, and I think in if I go back and, you know, honestly speaking in those days, I don't think we had the, the right level of investment. I think now you see it, you know, the screens in the car will be the highest definition, highest contrast screens available on the market when this car launches in a few weeks. And that, that really shows that level of ambition. So that screen technology, I think saying that, you know, the, the technology is really layered into the car. We've also put a big emphasis on the tactility of all the controls. So, you know, you have this beautiful knurling on the temperature control. It's really important for us to balance those two elements. Now, it's interesting looking at how the technology presents in here. It feels as if it's not overbearing. Some cars you get in now and they've got full width digital screens, not in the DB12. Is that a deliberate move? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the interior design team really really wanted to layer the technology in so again it's not screen first you know the craftsmanship is there the overall theme of the car is there and then the technology sits within that finding that balance in the layers and it's really important it is you know our cars are very tactile objects we all have a phone in our pocket that technology is expected and essential but actually where we make a difference is also in this tactility of all these functions, how you as a driver, you know, we talked about performance earlier. It's also about the human performance and how you interact with your car. So it's making sure that all these things are to hand and that your experience of driving is the best you can find. And I think it's very clever how you've even managed to repeat some of the, the graphics uh, from previous earlier Aston Martin. So I remember the mid noughties Mid to, uh, mid to early noughties uh, yeah. when the Vantage came out, the rev counter, the calibration on it, yeah. to me really sp speaks volumes to what I'm seeing here. With a, and you can do that with a digital touch point, can't yeah, you? Yeah, 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 you can. You can do, I mean, you can do, it's, it's difficult because actually you can do whatever you want. But yes, it does just pick up on um, what we call the chaplets, the little chaplets that came from that car. And the new infotainment system is Aston Martin's own. This is significant. The days of having Volvo systems, Mercedes systems, are over. This is your own in-house proprietary setup. Very, very high-res screen. I think it's sort of over 1,900 pixels um, sharp, and it's a ten and a quarter inch screen. Yep. What does this mean for the future of Aston Martin <laughs> infotainment? Well, it it shows the step change that's gone on in the company. So I think you know in the last three years that increase in the design team working on interiors, working on UI UX. It, it was necessary. It's absolutely, if you, if you, it is part of the signature of the brand. It's now a digital signature of the brand, but you know, we had to, we had to do it ourselves. It's a big undertaking to do it, um, but integrating it, having the brand experience, it's essential. And of course, this is therefore the first fully connected car yes. from Aston Martin. This is significant. So. The DB12 is going to let us do over-the-air updates, so the car will uh, learn and gain new features for its life cycle. There's going to be an Aston Martin app. You'll be able to unlock your car, do all the things you can do with a connected car uh, on your DB12, and I guess for future models as well. This is very significant, isn't it? Yeah, and it opens up great opportunities for the future. It's, it's very exciting to have that now integrated into the car, and it'll be very interesting to see the feedback and other elements that we get and how we use that in the future. It's, it's a new thing for us. And I think you get three years of uh, sort of subscription included, but there will be a sort of a revenue generating opportunity for the company over time, I guess, with some of the services which make yeah, it possible. Yeah. 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 So watch this space. This crisp modern interior shows the balance that Aston Martin is striking with the new DB12. Its sports cars need soul, dramatic style, timeless beauty, and analog involvement for the driver, yet they must also deliver the kind of digital engagement and everyday usability that customers now demand. The DB12 therefore sets a new template for what we can expect of modern day Aston Martins, emotional sports cars that can stylishly offer the best of both worlds.